All right, so uh, starting a new series this morning. I've been talking about it. I've been excited about it. Um, it's finally here. The series title is The Five-Fold Framework, and uh, I've really done a ton of work on this in the past, uh, well, I've been working on it for a long time, but really in the past year, probably just um, learning a lot, seeking the Lord, praying, studying, and so on and so forth, and um, he's, he's shown me some things, uh, maybe clarified, helped me understand a little bit better some things, not really new concepts, um, uh, rather uh, revitalized, at least in my soul. Um, and I've been trying to put these and implement these into my life, in different areas of my life. And, and I can tell you right now that the Lord is good. And when we walk uh, as he's called us to walk, you wouldn't believe uh, what uh, is possible. So, Let's turn our attention now to the Lord and to his word. If you would stand to your feet with me, we're going to read in Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to, uh, I'm not going to do this every Sunday, but I'm going to for the first uh, kicking off of this uh, series. I'm going to read um, chapter 4 of Ephesians verses 1 through 16, verses 1 through 16, so a little bit longer section, but then we're going to focus today on Ephesians 4, 1 through 7. Siri, I'm preaching this message. You cannot help. I'm so sorry. All right, Ephesians 4. That was really weird. Uh, Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. You guys bear with me. I've got a cold or something. I'm not feeling great, but uh, the Lord will energize us. Amen? All right, Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you are called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, When he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and, gave, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended, far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves, and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. May God bless the reading and hearing of his word. You may be seated. So I want to start out today uh, with really just a couple of pieces of information. If you already have the Church Center app on your phone, you'll find the notes uh, in the Church Center app. There will be a part down at the bottom that will say Sermon Notes. You can click on that, and you'll have the notes for today. Uh, I can print out paper copies if I need to, but we can save some trees and save some money if you guys, uh, I think most all of you have cell phones. If you don't know how to get that, let me know and I can help you with that. Also, if uh, you want to get some more information, some more material, there, is a, there should be on your phone, uh, at, on the Church Center app, when you pull it up, you'll see in the far right-hand corner, this is what mine looks like, you'll see in the far right-hand corner it says Resources. Okay, If you click on Resources, you'll see the archive notes from all the sermons from when I started doing this whole thing. What? Well, well, 
What will? You have all the archive notes from all the sermons that I've done since I started doing this, uh, but I also put some other resources in there, some stuff that I've been working on, some helpful things that I feel like might help you, especially as we go through this uh, sermon series. If you uh, are with me, click on your church app, click on the resources. I want to show you something here. The top one there that I just put in uh, recently, it says an overview of the fivefold framework by Brennan Poree. This is an overview of a lot of the stuff I've been working on for the past year. And it'll kind of explain a lot, uh, it'll, it'll explain a lot to you about what I see the scripture pushing us towards. Not just as particular ministries or particular ministries within the church, but just life. Just a, a group, a body of, of believers who do life together, and this will kind of start to fit maybe a little bit better into your mind, into your life, because I'm really, 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 really hoping, praying, and expecting that as the Word of God goes forth into my life, into my heart, into your life, into your heart, that, that it would actually bring about change, and that you would think about how your life is organized and is it organized around these truths and these realities? Or do you just hear the word of God and maybe say something to the effect of, man, that's a cool truth, or man, I, I haven't heard that, or maybe I've heard that before. But do you hear a word and you think, yeah, that's true. I can see that in the Bible. He brought it out of the Bible. I see that. But I am not going to think about this truth again. I'm, it is not going to affect my life. Yeah, that's true. Everybody's called. We should live in humility. All the aspects of our life are to be intentionally thought through and how do we glorify Christ with these things. Yeah, I know all that's true, but I don't care. Or do we say, Lord God, I see the truth. I know I'm not going to be able to live it out perfect today, but could you help me take a step in the right direction? And then actually put pen to paper, put your hand to the plow, put your thoughts into action, whatever it might be, and say, these are the changes that I'm going to make today. These are the one or two changes I know I can make today that will help to move me in the right direction at least this much. At least this much. And us to actually start doing what God has called us to do. Now, let me, as, as a clarifying point, I'm not saying that none of you are doing anything. I'm not, Okay. What I'm saying is, I don't care what you're doing, we can always do more. That's right. And maybe you say, well, I can't do more. Okay, well, let me clarify even further. No matter what you're doing, you may be doing as much as you can do. Let's then say, we can always do it better. More Christ-like, more spirit-filled, more powerful, more engaging, more influential, more declaration of the goodness of God, more work for the kingdom, more adoration, more love, more dedication to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Uh, it's, getting, it's getting alarming in here. <laughs> yes, I hear you, Lord. All right, so the overarching title would be to this whole thing is the fivefold framework and I and I didn't use ministry on purpose because one I, this whole idea it's not a ministry it's not a ministry it is a framework for all of life and all of ministry you, we have to understand that we tend to distinguish for some reason and I'm not going to beat this I beat this horse I can't even tell it's a horse anymore that I've told you and told you and told you, we have this crazy distinction between ministers and Christians. That is not in the Bible. It is not a reality. It is forced onto Christianity. It is adopted from pagan secular notions of this divided identity mumbo jumbo silliness. No, Christ is your life, and your life is Christ. It is in Christ. And our whole life, if we're true believers, born again, the Spirit abides in us, our entire life is a ministry. It's just a good one or a bad one. Your whole life is ministry. It is to be ministry. And listen to me, folks. Self-check. Let's do a heart check right now. 
if you are not ministering, then you really need to, I'm not your judge. I do not know the heart. Only God does. But if you are not ministering in any capacity, you really need to ask yourself if you belong to God, if you are a child of God, if the Spirit of the living God is dwelling in you, because where the Spirit goes, the Son is exalted. Now, maybe we just need repentance. Maybe we just need <clears throat> to put our faith into action. I know there are struggles. I know that. I have to repent regularly. You should repent regularly. It doesn't mean that we're not washed of our sins, but we need to continue in the process of sanctification. But that we're continually seeking God to ask him, show me my sins, show me my flaws, show me where I'm weak. And help me to shed those off, to, to be relieved, to be washed of those, that I might be more for you, Lord. Not more for me, but more for you. So the first week, I was going to do the foundation. Uh, and I've got a breakdown for anybody who would want it. I can put this on. I don't know if I put this on there, but uh, I, I can put this on the archived resource list, too. Um, if everything goes according to plan. And that's a big if. Uh, the series should be 17 weeks. So we're looking at 53, 54, somewhere around in there. We should be all right. I'm just, Heather's looking at me like, what? 17 weeks, okay? Let's try to, let's try to make it 17 weeks. And, and, I, and, you know, I really, you know, prayed over this, and I think that this is, I think that this is uh, what the Lord's leading me to. So, uh, yeah. All right, Ephesians, let's get into week number one. Week number one, it's in your notes. Uh, if you don't have it, then I've got, uh, for the most part, I've got it up here. The foundation. What's the foundation of the fivefold framework? Now, let me just give a quick intro. We've talked about the fivefold. I've called it different things. Fivefold principle, fivefold ministry, fivefold framework. I landed on framework, you know, whatever. This is just my way of describing it. The reason I landed on framework is that <clears throat> when you look at this passage of Scripture, it talks a lot about building, building, equipping, building. It's kind of this almost a construction motif that God gave certain types of gifts that people would be equipped, trained, skilled in order to do what? In order to build something. You see the construction motif there. You know, Matt's in construction. Uh, John Demetrius in destruction. Uh, destruction. <laughs> yeah, hey, man. No, that's my job. That's, Donnie's a, a destruction expert. Uh, so uh, John's in construction. And, and these guys, they hire people. They, uh, they themselves have been trained. Jake works for uh, um, uh, MAD. They, they have all of these guys that are trained in different things, right? The different giftings, different skill sets. And they employ these different people that, that, that they would be able to do what? That they would be able to build a structure, a house, whatever it might be, that they would be able to build a structure, and because the people are gifted and skilled, trained in certain ways, that the structure would be built right, that the structure would go up in a, in a timely manner, that the structure would go up to, to do whatever it was intended to do, whether that may be an office or maybe it is a um, a garage or whatever that might be. You build the structure and you have to follow steps. You have to know what you're doing. Otherwise, you've, it's not going to be what you desired for it to be. It won't stand right if you don't put the foundation in right. It doesn't last long. If you don't build it just in square, then it's all wonky and you, you're, nothing, nothing goes right if you don't get, get it square. You know, all your carpets out of it. So it's just a mess. You have to have skilled laborers. And that's, what, that's the motif that we're looking at here. He gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists. For what? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ in the church. Okay? We see this. So I want to look this morning at the foundation of the five-fold framework. Okay? Where does, where does the church, the building... Not the building, but the building up of the church. Where does it start? What, what are the key components of this church expanding? And I'm not talking about just growing in number, okay? That's great. I, I, it wouldn't bother me if we packed it out so there was standing room only. I think that's the way it should be. But that's not really what I'm talking about. I think that that will come if we get the first part right, uh, if the Lord wills it. 
But what I'm talking about is, is building you, building me, building our faith, building our unity, building our willingness to work together, to sacrifice, to be servants, to answer the call that's been placed on your life. How many of us are sitting in this room right now and the Lord has called us to something and we dismiss it, we, we justify it, we do the backdoor pride thing and we say, oh Lord, I, you know I'm not good enough for that. Pick someone better. You know That, that is a simply passive pride that said, God, I know better than you you picked the wrong one, go back and try again. Come back when you got a better idea. You see how it's backdoor pride. It seems humble. I am no good, Lord. Silliness. How many of us have been called? You say, are you telling me that I may be called to preach every Sunday or to go to China? No, I'm not telling you that. We have to erase that. We have to erase those categories. What I'm telling you is you may be called to uh, where do you work? Look, yeah, you. What? 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 Welchel Welch Electrical, right? You are called to be a missionary at Welchel Electrical. You understand that? No, I'm asking you. Do you understand that? Do you understand that wherever you're called, wherever you work, you are called to be a missionary there. You are called to be an evangelist there. You are called to be a teacher there. You are called to cast vision in your apostolic gifting there. You are called to, to be able to hold people to a standard in your prophetic gift. You say, well, you're telling me that every single one of us are apostles, prophets? I am telling you that every single one of us are to train, to pursue, to seek, as Paul said, all the gifts that we are to, if we are better or higher or better uh, qualified, say, in teaching, and maybe you're pastoral gifting is down here or maybe your prophetic is up here and your pastoral is down here or whatever it might be then praise the lord get after it prophetically but learn find a pastor who's good in pastoral ministry who's good in pastoral gifting and say i need to hang out with you for a little while because i'm terrible at that can i learn from you Humble yourself and gather for yourself good teachers not teachers that are going to tickle your ears You see how hard this is? It's not, I mean, I, I, not me, I do, I do this too, but human beings, you know what we tend to do? We tend to be like hyenas. We run in packs of those who are just like us. And we are absolutely determined not to even get around people who are not like us. And you develop these identity politics and all of these cliques and all of these groups and all of this and all of that. When the gospel is the most invasive reality that, that, in, in, that invades, is invasive, that in, infiltrates every culture, every difference, and says, hey, cool, keep the difference as long as it's not unbiblical, and I'll redeem it. So that we will have a leg and a beautiful point of unity in every single group that exists. Because there's not, it's not as if all distinctions are horrible and evil. It's not. But there are to be unifying factors that transcend all of those diverse points of, uh, uh, of reality or whatever you might want to say. Does that make sense? We we don't think about these things. We, we're just going through the motions. Please stop being robots. Together, we, you, all of you can say, uh, please, pastor, stop being a robot. Please, pastor, stop being a robot. Do you know how often I can get into a rut of being a robot? For the first several years of my pastorate, you know, I had no idea who I was. I loved, I loved Mark Driscoll. I listened to him all the time. I loved uh, 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 Tim Keller. I loved John Piper. I loved all of these guys. And for the longest time, I was like, I, I tried to preach like Driscoll. I didn't have my own voice. Then I was like, ah, that don't fit. I tried to preach like 
Tim Keller, and I'm like, I'm way not smart enough for this. And I try to preach like Piper, and I'm like, I am not uh, holy enough for this. And, and finally, the Lord gave me my voice. But you know what had to happen? And you know, it was hard. It was hard. And I'm still working on it every single day. Like, you guys see me come in here. One day I got notes, the next day I don't. <laughs> you know, you see me chase that rabbit. I'm, I'm, I'm sick. I'm about to fall over dead of exhaustion. I'm like, I'm going to get you. I'm come here. I'm still trying to figure it out. But you know what? You know what we got to do? Put one foot in front of the other and just keep on going. Because God has a plan. And it's not you anyway. It's not me anyway. The moment, and I found this to be true, the moment that I think I've got it figured out. I've got all my ducks in a row. I'm organized. I've got my notes here. And I've got my blah, 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 blah. God's like, let me just knock you right off that high horse. Because let me tell you something. And, and this is, the Lord has demonstrated to me, demonstrated this to me more times than I can count. The sermons that I think are the best. And listen, don't let me stand up here with a cape on. I've come off this stage before, and I would never say this out loud, right? But I've come off this stage before. I, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to be this transparent with you and thought, I did good on that one. That was a good one. I was funny. I was, and somebody, somebody come up just, bam! I'm like, oh. And the Lord come off the top rope. Boom! I'm like, ugh. <laughs> and he's like, you fool. You know, every, every time, hey, listen, let me tell you something right now that you need to be careful of. This is a side note. This is one of those little rabbits. I'm going to run him for a second, all right? Don't, hey, listen, stay off the roof of your house. I'm telling you right now, stay off the roof of your house. Hey, just remember what happened to David when he went up on the roof of his house. Nebuchadnezzar goes up on the roof of his house. He looks out and he's like, Look at all my land. Look at what I have built. And the Lord's like, I'm going to make you eat for a cow, like a cow for a while. He lost his mind, lost his mind. David fell slam off of his rocker, right? Those who God, op God opposes the proud, he gives grace to the humble. I've walked off this stage before, and I thought, that's the worst sermon I've ever preached in my entire life. All over the place. Forgot what I was saying. Lord, I'm miserable. Maybe I need to just go home, hang it up, see if one of these other boys can jump up here, because I'm just, this is just awful. That was horrible. Just walk off like this. Don't even look at me. And really, to the depths of my soul, thing, that was just awful. And had somebody come up to me, tears streaming down their face and say the Lord has never spoke to me so strongly before and I said well it had to be the Lord because this guy right here just bomb you know no no hey my wife sitting right here she can tell you plenty of stories <laughs> I think she keeps a log no, no, she never brings up the past. <laughs> Neither do I. And we don't lie either. You see, it's, it's Christ, and, and we have to lose ourselves to find ourselves. We're never going to be perfect. And, and some of you thinking, you know, I don't know how to preach. I don't know how to teach. I don't know how to. Look, you know how to open your mouth, flap your gums, and just talk about what Jesus has done for you. How do we overcome? By, by the word of the Lamb and the power of our testimony. Now, maybe you're like, ah, I'm not great with the word of the Lamb. What's the word of the Lamb, by the way? The scripture. What's, the, what's your testimony? It's just what God's done for you, right? You, maybe you're like, I'm not really good with the word of the Lamb. Number one, get better. Stop making excuses. I just don't read good. Well, you read well enough to get around. Road signs are words. If you can learn those, then you can learn to read a book. If you can't learn to read, there are... There are absolutely legitimate learning disabilities. Absolutely there are. They have these things called audio books. They have what's now, if you've never heard of it, YouTube. 
If you go on YouTube, I, hey, all jokes aside for a second, if, if you do struggle with the concepts of Scripture, holler at me after the service because there's these, uh, this guy, these guys did these, and there's lots of, lots of different ones. I just like these guys. The Bible Project guys, is that what you call them? The Bible Project guys are so good. This is very simple. I don't agree, you know, with a 100% of their breakdowns, but, but very good. They do these little sketch drawings, and he's got this kind of an odd voice, but he's like, you know, the Bible in First John, you know. And, but he sketches it out. He, like, draws it. So if you're like, man, I would like to know more, but these concepts are just so big for me. I read the Bible, and I'm like, what is this talking about? These guys do a great job of breaking it down very on a, like a, even an elementary level with pictures, like it, it's really, really good. And I'm not demeaning. I watch them. I watch them, and I'm like, I never thought about that. That's pretty good right there, right? So it's not a, like a level. I'm not telling you, you know, go watch these if you're dumb. You know, I'm not. No, these are good for everybody. But if you struggle with that reading comprehension, these guys are great. And you can find at least 500 million hours of sermons or something like that online, okay? There's no excuses. That's what I'm saying. You are called to ministry. The foundation of, of the five-fold framework, week one, the called. Okay, so we're focusing on calling, calling, calling. Next week will be humility. So these are the two points of foundation. There's so much more. This is what I want to focus on, and uh, that was a long intro, I know, but I won't need to spend much time on this because we've, I've actually already preached this sermon I was, you thought I was joking a while ago, I have. If you'll, go, if you'll remember, I preached a sermon called Everybody a Minister. That's this sermon. But I want to do this by way of reminder and to kind of set the stage from where we're going, uh, for where we're going from here. So <clears throat> the first part of the foundational work is the calling uh, that is on your life. Now, let me, let me do this as, as a type of... Um, uh, parentheses or a parenthetical uh, uh, note is that you know, well, I hope you know me that that my my uh, doctrinal position, my my reality, what I want to hold on to, and what I want to make the most uh, prominent part of any sermon that I do, any theology that I have, any doctrine that I believe is what. The centrality of Jesus Christ and him being the focal point of all reality, all scripture, and all truth. That doesn't mean that Jesus Christ is the highest exalted member of the Trinity. No, it means that the Trinity, the Godhead, however you want to say that, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they have roles that they carry out in the grand scheme of things that the Father wills, the Son does, and the Holy Spirit applies. These these work, these, this God, our God, the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they work in such a fashion as that they are accomplishing something, and the roles that they have ushers Jesus Christ as the exalted one that is the face of this. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And, and, and of the Holy Spirit, too. A lot of people say we need to turn our, our, our focus completely on the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is now the one that's descended, and, and now he's the one on the scene, and that we are to focus more on the Holy Spirit. Now, you see, uh, uh, Pentecostal church is oftentimes leaning, in my opinion, too heavily this way. No, remember that the Scripture, I believe it's in Matthew chapter 16, it expressly says that the Spirit is always doing what? Glorifying the Son. So everywhere the Spirit goes, He glorifies the Son. Everything that the Father has done has been done in the Son. And so the Holy Spirit is applying the work of Christ that was willed by the Father, and Jesus Christ is to be exalted. His name is to be above every name, right? We're to, well, uh, yeah, we'll get to, no, it'll be next week. We're, we're going to see how God explains to us uh, why, or I would, I would maybe explain it this way, why, uh, how the method that God the Father uh, purposed and planned for Christ to walk out in order for his name to be exalted to the highest place. You say, well, he was God. Well, what we need to remember is, is, that, is that while Jesus Christ is, is fully God, he is also Fully man. This, we call this, I don't want to, you know, chase this rabbit. I'm, I'm trying my best to ignore him. But 
the hypostatic union is the is the uh, the intricate intertwining the reality however you want to describe it using words that always fall short of of God the Son taking on he a lot of people say God became a man he really didn't and you say wait whoa, 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 what Okay, well, if words matter, let me be a theological nick for just a second, okay? And, and look, this is good for you. You need to understand this. God did not become a man. How many of you are like, I'm about to leave? No. Listen. Well, let me ask you a question. You said, yes, God did become a man. I've heard that since I was little. Well, did God quit being God when, it, when Jesus was born? No. So God did not transform into something else deity did not become humanity right you're saying you're splitting hairs yes i am this is a big enough doctrine that we need to split hairs for just a second just so we not so that you can go around and 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 pick on your friends and say you know god became a man and saved us look i don't have a problem with that i'm not i don't have a problem with that i'm being i told you i admitted it i'm being a theological nick nick for just a second so i can make a point right here God did not become a man. God, who is God, added humanity to himself. And then what what was there was the God-man. You see, if God became a man, then God turns into a man. No. God, deity, God the Son, added humanity to his being, Jesus Christ. Jesus, who is the Christ. You see, Jesus, the man, did not always exist. (laughs) And we're getting in some waters now, ain't we? God the Son always existed. But until the Jesus, the man who was added to the Godhead, okay, the Son, until those two joined together in the hypostatic union, Jesus was actually born. He really was born. He really was a man. Do you believe that? God, the Son who existed from eternity past and will exist always, took humanity onto himself in the virgin birth, in the immaculate uh, conception when he was born, in, this, uh, in the incarnation, Jesus the man was born and J- God the Son joined together with man creating the God-man. God always existed. Jesus in his human form came together. The hypostatic union now exists, and he did all of this work. Why do we, why do, we do all of that? Because here's the, here's the point of all of this theological stuff. If Jesus Christ does not answer his call, there is no call that can be said to be a reality on your life you're just bound for hell i'm convinced that many of us think that our call is no big deal that i don't have a call on my life that that guy up there on stage has a call on his life that guy who's got a doctorate in in bible theology he has a call on his life that evangelist he's got a call on his life i don't have a call on my life and if i do i don't know about it and who cares It's not a big deal. Well, if Jesus Christ doesn't answer his call, then every one of us go to hell. Could it be said that if you don't answer your call, that you will be responsible for some people burning in hell for all of eternity? You say, well, no, God's sovereign. He saves all of his. Listen, I'm one that believes in the sovereignty of God and the choice and freedom of men. Wait a minute, what? What if it is that God predestined all of those who would be in heaven and the means by which they will get to heaven is that he predestined you to answer the call to go and do the work of the minister? And if they do not answer the call that you did not answer, then who's responsible? They are. Yes, they are, but you are as well. I can walk that out in the scripture you want to. I don't have time. Bottom line is, is that your call is of absolute significance, and it all begins with the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is a central figure. Jesus Christ is the one, his call makes all calls possible. 
His humility take, makes all humility possible. His salvation, you say, wait, Jesus was not saved. Yes, he was. Jesus Christ was resurrected. Jesus' death makes the death of your flesh possible. Jesus' resurrection makes the resurrection of your soul possible. Jesus' ascension makes your ascension possible. Jesus' obedience to the Father makes your obedience to the Father possible. As a matter of fact, we have the imparted righteousness of Christ, and I would even say the active obedience imparted to us that Jesus Christ is the only one deserving. And what I mean by that is this. You are not only washed clean of your sins, but you are given credit for obeying God as if you were Jesus. You understand that? The looks are saying you don't understand that. Let me say it this way. And I know this is some theology, but, but we need it. We haven't learned it. It seems apparent we haven't learned it. We think that the only thing, we think that the only way salvation works is that I've done bad things, Jesus died so that the bad things aren't on my account anymore, and therefore I go to heaven. Partly true. That's only part of it. You see, what is necessary for you to have ongoing relationship with God is that you have no sin, check, yes. But also that what? You are perfectly oh, obedient. You see, there are, sins of, uh, there are sins of commission, yes. The things you do that you shouldn't do. But guess what? There are sins of omission, too. The things you were supposed to do and you didn't do. You see, Jesus Christ, he died the death we should have died, but he also lived the life we should have lived. And all of that gets credited to our account. Our sins die in Christ, and our souls live in Christ. That's why you can't lose your salvation. Because you didn't earn it. You're not keeping it. It's all in Christ. Did you know that your union with God is solely based on his merit? And he is never not worthy. So you are always worthy. Because you're great? No. But because he is. And if he doesn't answer the call, you don't have a call. If he's not humble, you're not humble. If he's not obedient, you're not obedient. If he doesn't ascend, you don't ascend. You see, it's all about Christ. But we need to understand that as Jesus Christ did everything for us to meet the Father, to see the Father, to live in the Father, to join the Father, to join him in eternity and in the now, as he did that, so he we are like him in his death so we can be like him in his life. So some people want to come to the cross and they can say, I believe in Jesus. He died for me. He washed me of my sins. I'm good to go. <clears throat> they want to take the death benefits of Christ, but they don't want to live as Christ. You know, what, what does that sound like to you? Sounds to me like... The prodigal son. Father, give me my inheritance now, even though you are not dead. Essentially saying, I wish you were dead because I do not want to be around you and I want all of your stuff, but I don't want to live as your son. See how it is? You know what that is the definition of? Many of you think that taking God's name in vain is, is a, is a two-part cuss word. Maybe that is sometimes. No, what I just described is taking the Lord's name in vain. Supposed fire insurance. I prayed the prayer, preacher. I ain't going to hell no more. Yeah, I don't never live for Jesus. I don't even think about him no more. But hey, I prayed the prayer in VBS one time. It's taking the Lord's name in vain. You said, depart from me, I never knew you. Ephesians 4, <coughs> 1 through 3, again, I've already talked on a bunch of this stuff. I really wanted to get more of the tedious, doctrinal, foundational stuff out of the way because all of this is significant in mind in your life. You know that whole thing I was talking to you about, the hypostatic union? And the difference between saying, you know, God became a man and died for us. I don't have a problem with that. I, I know what you mean by that. But have you, let, let me just ask a, a question, right? And you can even answer. Have you really thought about that sentence before? And, I, and I've, got a, I've got a point by asking this question. Have you really thought about that sentence before? God became a man. Well, did God become a man, God, or did he take humanity and add it to himself so he became the God-man? 
You say, why does it matter? It really matters. If you say that God became a man and ceased being God, that's heresy of the highest order. But why else does it matter? It, it matters this way. I'm, okay, let me clarify this a little bit. I'm not saying that you have to think about love, be passionate about theology like I am. I mean, that would undercut my entire series. Because I am well aware that some of us are gifted in some ways and some of us are gifted in other ways. We see that in 1 Timothy where it gives the qualifications for elder and the qualifications of deacon. That we know by those qualifications that elders are more word and thought oriented. Deacons are more people and uh, service oriented. Why would I say that? Because one of the qualifications for elder is they must be able to teach. A deacon does not need to be able to teach to be qualified to be a deacon. He has to serve. And he has to look after the needs of others. Can't be a gossip. Right? Why? Because gossip destroy people. If you're a gossip, then you're a destroyer of people. That's what you do. So, so I'm not saying that you have to, you know, dig into systematic. I'm not saying all that. But what I'm saying is, is that we do need to understand that we are to be continually growing in our understanding of who Christ is so that we might be able to be who Christ has called us to be. Now, uh, Roberts, he, had to, he got called into work. They had a, a water line bus or something, but uh, he oftentimes makes this distinction uh, between he and I. is uh, himself and me, I think. That's, sorry, babe, you can tell me how I did that. Was supposed to do that later. I really I, that, that one's hard. Anyway, he said he says all the time. He says the way I learn, the way I study is more devotional. More devotional, and that's got it's, it's got wonderful merits. It's wonderful. It's a wonderful relational. It's wonder. It's wonderful in, in in a more intimate way. The way I study is more technical. Now I like the devotional stuff too, from time to time. But uh, it it doesn't. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't sit with me like it sits with him. We're just different people. And you know, the, the, the wonderful thing is, is that his is needed a lot, and mine is needed a lot. And so we come together and we make one halfway decent guy. <laughs> Which is what this whole thing is all about. You see, I'm more, it, it's a very alarming If I use that joke two times in a row and it wasn't even funny the first time, does it make it better the second time? <laughs> what hypostatic. Hypostatic. This actually, it's a good question. That, that is actually two words joined together. And if I'm not mistaken, this is from the um, Latin. And hypo and static means the uh, undergirding reality and the meshing of the two realities. So it's almost like the essence of a being being compressed to the other. So it's this joining. Uh, I kind of think of it as like a, a, a hydraulic cylinder pressing this static force, bang, into another. The hypostatic union was, the, uh, and this is, you won't find hypostatic in the, in the Bible, but, you know, we have to develop terms just so we can try to understand. Hypostatic union is the doctrine that just describes the joining together of God the Father, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, God the Son to man, okay, Jesus Christ the man, that they, they are now one. They are inextricable. You can never, ever, ever. So see, whereas Jesus Christ the man didn't always exist, God the Son did always exist. And in the incarnation, God took on humanity. God the Son took on humanity. And Jesus Christ, the God-man, is now walking on the earth, and he is mediating between, he, he's the mediator between God and man, and it will never be undone. And so God, uh, God the Son, Jesus Christ, will always be the God-man throughout all the rest of eternity. But, but he was not the God-man in the beginning. Does that make sense? Be careful uh, how you go talking to other people about this. Uh, because they will call you a heretic, and if you get a few parts wrong, then you will be a heretic. I am not saying that God the Son didn't always exist. I did not say that. I have not said that. I will never say that. God the Son has always existed. The God-man has not always existed. Jesus Christ was born. 
You understand that? God, God the Son did not exist as Jesus Christ, the God-man, from eternity past. God the Son existed in the form of God. Remember uh, Philippians chapter 2. It's all over the Bible. Now that I've told you all of this, and if you picked it up, when you start reading the New Testament, you'll be like, oh my goodness, look, there it is. <laughs> That's what I love about the Bible. It's like, boom, there it is. Well, remember in Ephesians, uh, Philippians 2? Now you put me on this rabbit. I'm not taking any credit for this. If he's, uh, Philippians chapter 2 says, even though he existed in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself uh, and, and took on the, uh, the form of, a, of a, a, a man, even a servant. You see, Jesus Christ, he existed in the form of God. Now, they're talking about God the Father there. What is God the Father? Anybody know from Scripture? What is he? Spirit, Spirit right? God the Father doesn't have a body. All those times in the Old Testament, yes, exactly what I'm saying. All those times in the Old Testament where uh, they say no one can look on the face of God and live. It, that's called anthropomorphic language. God doesn't have a face. I mean, unless you want to talk about Jesus' face. Now, I will say that there are, I relate those to Christophanies in the Old Testament where people do see God. They're standing there talking to him. I'm one that holds to, that's Jesus Christ. I call it a Christophany in the Old Testament. I also believe that the angel of the Lord Every time you see the, uh, the phrase, the angel of the, and it has the definite article, the, the. When you see the angel of the Lord, that's Jesus Christ. And he is breaking into history and manifesting himself. That's the only way you can see God. You, can, you'll, you can't see God unless you're looking at Jesus. You can't see God unless you're looking at Jesus. Jesus, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, Hebrews chapter 1. You know, Jesus, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus is the representative, uh, representative uh, person of the, of the Godhead. When you, see Je- when you see God, you're looking at Jesus. So anyway, I appreciate that 15-minute rabbit. Let's break this. I'm, I'm just going to move through these just a little bit, and uh, we're going to kind of tie a few things together. Um, we're doing good on time, real good. You might not think so, but, uh, well, maybe we're not. I don't know. All right, Ephesians 4, 1 through 3, calling. So remember, let me, I don't know, I've been kind of all over the place, but let me, let me say that. And if you got your notes, uh, I didn't follow it all, but you can look at it. It's good info. Uh, <laughs> calling, we're going to look next week at humility. Calling and humility. My main point today was is that, that every single human being that has ever been born again has also been called. The salvation and indwelling of the Spirit is your call. <laughs> you say, what is a call? What is a call? A call is only being moved by the Spirit to do what spiritual beings do. That's exalt God. That's all. You see, this is, we made this too complicated. You say, well, I'm not called into the ministry. Or you get up, and I'm not knocking this. If you've done this, please don't hear me this way. Uh, you see uh, young people, they get saved, and they get, I did this. So I'm, if I'm knocking anybody, I'm knocking me. Let me knock me, okay? You see young people get saved, uh, they, you know, are walking with the Lord, and they feel this strong urge that they are to do more, right? And so what do they do? They get up and they what? Announce their call. You ever seen somebody do that? Yeah, I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to call them up and, you know, bless them, I don't know. But this, is, this, is, this is what has given us this idea, is that there are some Christians who are called to ministry. And then there are others, they're just, you know, normal Christians. What does that even mean? Can somebody please give me a definition of a normal Christian? No, I'm serious. Can anybody? Give me a, give me a definition of what, what would be an understanding of what that might mean. Go ahead, Jake. What, what do you think it might mean when people say a normal Christian? Yeah, so regular church tenders, maybe a tither, yeah. Uh, maybe they pray, right? And those are all good things. Man, those are good things. But is, but, but is there really a, I mean, it can, it can anybody show me in Scripture where you can dif- differentiate between a, a Christian who is to be a proclaimer of the gospel, a gospel, an ambassador of Christ, a minister of reconciliation, and just a normal Christian. It doesn't exist. Now, can you see roles in the 
Bible on uh, how different Christians can be a part of the church? Sure you do. We see deacons, we see teachers, we see preachers, we see elders, we see lots of different things. But that, that may be distinguishing a role, but it's not saying that these are ministers and those are not. All it's saying is, is what type of minister are you? Uh, how about Phoebe? Anybody remember Phoebe? How did, what was her ministry? Anybody know? She was a, a dyer of fabric, was that right? She ministered to the church and she, she, she uh, blessed the church in that way. She also was uh, a servant in the church. She was a deaconess. You know, people say, women can't be deacons. You need to read the Bible. And uh, that was kind of harsh. I would say, let's clarify what you mean by deacon before we go uh, making these big, bold decisions. Okay? Okay. Uh, I just don't think you can, I don't think you can uh, justify that in Scripture. Um, now, elder, no. Deacon, yes. I've chased another rabbit. Bottom line is this. Every single individual has the Spirit of God dwelling in them is, is, is super, I was going to say naturally, but let's say supernaturally compelled to minister. It's just, see, it's not something you do, it's just who you are. That's probably the best way to describe it. It's not something you do. It's just who you are. So, so you are a minister wherever you go, whatever you're doing. Ministry shouldn't be defined as preaching or evangelism or mission work or Bible school. No, all of, all of life is ministry. All of lawful life is ministry. And all of ministry is life. You're a minister everywhere you go, every, everything you do. Like, you know, maybe you, you like to stop at a convenience store and get uh, a drink and a pack of peanuts. Well, maybe you say, how can I stop and get a, a, a drink and a pack of peanuts to the glory of God? How many of you think that's kind of silly? I promise you. What if you said, okay, I'm going to stop and get a pack of peanuts and a drink, and I'm probably going to do this every day or every other day because I take the same route to work. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick one gas station, and I'm going to stop at that gas station every time to get my drink and pack of peanuts. And every time I go in there, I'm going to make it. Uh, I'm going to make an explicit attempt to just ask a question about the cashier. Hey, how you doing today? You got kids? Oh, that's cool. How many? Awesome. We have a good day. You say we well, didn't present the gospel. Hey, man, we got to have a little setup here. All right. So every day you're going in there, you're getting to know them, you're getting to know them. They're asking you questions now. You develop a friendship with them. Hey, you know, I just was just going to ask. Are you a believer? No, I'm not a believer. Well, have you ever heard the gospel? You say, I couldn't do that. No, you won't do that. But you can do that. The Lord can lead you to do that. All right, let's run through this real, real quick. Um, the calling, the calling, the calling. You've got to answer the calling if you want to actually live out a life of ministry. I, therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. Now, again, we've already done a ton of this. The calling to which you uh, have been called. Okay, so who's this letter to? Anybody remember? Yeah, it's just the people in Ephesus. You know, they had a church in Ephesus. People were attending that church. Is this to the, the council of elders in Ephesus? No, it's just to the church. So he's just writing to normal people like you, right? Well, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but it, but it's, it's, listen, worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit of the bond of peace. Now, there's so, there's so much here, so much, so much, so much. But I, obviously, I don't have time for that. But is this, is this to the whole church? Who's he saying the worthy of the calling to which you, who's the you? Yeah, this church, the whole church, every believer, every believer. What's up? What's the therefore? The therefore is to uh, make you ask what it's there for. <laughs> uh, good question, though. It, every Now, I, you're, just, you're trying to make me run a rabbit. I was trying to get out here by 12. Everybody look at Kenzie and say, it's your fault, Kenzie. Look, every time you say therefore, you're to ask the question. Therefore. What's it there for? Man, you started this and you messed it up. You say therefore, you say, what's it there for? Well, we'd have to go back to where? What's the immediate context? Where would we have to go back to? Chapter 3. 
So whatever he said, he said, this is true, this is true, this is true, this is true. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk. But I don't have time to do that. But if you want to, I'll talk to you after service. A prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk uh, in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Main point, you, and if you're saying it, then it's I. So everybody say, I. I. Have been called. All right, so all together, I have been, that was horrible. That was bad. Was that my fault or yours? No way. See, you guys are, yeah, y'all don't Stop ganging up on me. Okay, well, then y'all do it. One, two, three. Was that Craig Moore? He said, you. Was that you, Craig Moore? I, I know, I know, I know. But y'all said y'all could do it right without me. Okay, okay. We're going to get this right. <laughs> ah, Craig. <laughs> All right, listen. One, two, three. We all have been called. If you're a believer, you've been called. Now, have you been called to preach on stage? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Have you been called to go to Africa? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But I know one thing. You've been called, right? Amen? <laughs> Amen. Four through six, there is one body. So everybody's been called. There's one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith. One baptism, one God, and the Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Look at all these. One, 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 one. So what would you think that the big uh, point here is? Unity. Okay? So what, why did I keep doing that thing a while ago when we were talking about I have been called? Because it sounds a lot better, makes a lot more sense if we're all what? Unified in one voice. You see, just like we said that, we came together in unity to say, I have been called. You see, there's an I in there, so it's an individual call, but it's part of a greater group of believers. And so if we want to get everyone together and we want the individual called believers to move in the same direction like a, like a well-formed, well-trained army, then we have to be unified. And what unifies us? One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope. You see, one body. We are all together, uh, gathered together as individuals. And this gathering together as individuals, each individually gifted, is called the church. And the more we come together and unify and work, the bigger the church gets, not just numerically, but also spiritually and in every other way. So we have, uh, we have the calling, the unity, and then lastly, diversity. Diversity, or we can say the individual. And this, these are the... The parts that make up the whole. But because he's talked about one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one spirit, one body, right? One, 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 one. And then he goes into verse eight and he's, uh, uh, verse 7 and he says, But grace was given to each, each one. What is the each one describing? Individuals. Does that make sense? He says, so we are to be unified in call, and individuals in gifting. And this makes up the whole. Does that make sense? He says, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now, we'll learn a lot more about this later on. But your gifting is not your gifting based on your talents and your personality it, it is absolutely takes that into consideration and that's a part of it but what does this tell us that your gift is according to 
It is, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ. Now, this goes back to, and you guys can come on up and play. I'm finishing out here. This will go back to this idea that, well, I'm not gifted in these ways, so I'll let somebody else answer that call. Well, if, it, if, if, your, if your ministry, your life, your Christianity was based on your personal skill, then, yeah, you're right. You should just not even try because there are none, none good, no, not even one. There are none who seek God, God. All have fallen short of the glory of God, right? All have gone astray. The apostle Paul says, I find in that there is nothing good in me. So, yes, you should just not even try. But luckily, praisefully, I don't know what that's the word, but thankfully, grace, and grace is given to each one. Grace is, oh, it's so good. Grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. So is your personal gifting that you have what carries it all? No, it's according to Christ's gifts. And, and all of your gifting, if it's beneficial, is setting on the gracious gift of Christ. This is where we stay. This is where we sit. This is where we are effective. This is what gets things done. It is not us, folks. Put the hand on the plow. Don't look back. Jesus is, is more than happy to work in and through you. The Holy Spirit can do more than you could possibly imagine. That He is willing. He is not, he is not saying no. He, he is longing to walk through the door. The Bible says don't grieve him. How do you grieve him? By not letting him empower you to shape you, to mold you, to teach you, to lead you, to grow you, to make much of, of, of himself through you, to make much of Christ through you. Is that the, 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 the Holy Spirit is, is longing to come and, and, and be your your teacher, your helper. That's what Jesus said. I go to prepare, to prepare a place for you. And I must go. Why? Because if I don't go, I can't send the helper. And the helper's coming to bring everything that I told you to mind. He is going to teach you. He's going to show. He is going to show you who I really am. So see guys, if you want to know what the Father's will is, you have to know the Son. And if you want to know the Son, you have to walk with the Spirit. If you want to see your life be fruitful, fruitful for God, then you have to get in, you got to get down with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says it's the fruit of the Spirit. It's not the fruit that you create when you work really hard. No, it's when you walk by the Spirit. You're led in the Spirit. You pray in the Spirit. You seek out the Spirit. You talk to the Spirit. The Spirit brings Jesus Christ into the forefront of your life. He starts to conform you to the image of Christ because nobody knows Christ like the Spirit. And he starts saying, you want it, you got it, baby. Spend some time with me. I'll make you just like Jesus. And you want to be like that because Jesus is amazing. Let's do work with God. This could be the, the beginning of a beautiful thing. There are so many people that you can reach that I will never be able to reach. And neither will he or she or anybody else. But you can. And God is calling you. You say, well, I'm just not. No, you're not. Praise the Lord you're not. Praise the Lord you don't think you are. Because that's the worst. When you think you're something, God can't use that. God opposes the proud. But you say, Lord, I am nothing, but you are everything. Let's get it done because I know you'll do it through me. And I'm, I'm here. I'm here in my sin. Me. I ain't got much, but what I got yours, right? Let's all stand to our feet. Do business with God. Put your hand on the plow.